Almighty Father, you are coming soon, and we know that you are, and we are looking forward to your return. We ask that you will assist us in understanding what your promises are, what you've told us about what we should look for in terms of your return, and how we are to understand the various biblical passages that talk about your return. We ask you'll give us wisdom and insight, and you'll make some of this material clear to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, last week we talked about three mill, three trib. There's actually a couple other views. One three mill mid trib, which means Jesus comes back in the middle of the tribulation, and another is pre mill post trib, which means he comes back after the tribulation, but those are very much less popular. So we only talk about pre mill pre trib, but you can kind of get the idea of what the differences would be. Uh, just Jesus coming at different points in the tribulation period. Today we're going to talk about post-millennialism. And post-millennialism is an end times view that focuses on the progressive victory and the expansive influence of Christianity. So unlike premillennialism, they say Christ will return after the millennium. And this view believes that we are currently in the millennium. And that during this undetermined length of time, Christians are tasked to extend the kingdom of God in the world through the preaching of the gospel and the saving work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of individuals. Now, there are immediately some things we can relate to. Because we believe that we are part of expanding the reach of Christianity, not only here in our city, in our state, in our country, but throughout the world. So there's an element of this that can be very appealing. Now there are two types of post-millennialism. One is futurist. That means that it believes that Jesus Christ is coming in the future. And one believes that Jesus returned already in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. We're going to talk about both of those. But as I told you, what I'd like to do is give you some tools to deal with how you study end time stuff. And so I'm giving you some more rules of interpretation. So the first rule of interpretation we're going to talk about today is called internal consistency. And that means that images that appear somewhere else in scripture especially in apocalyptic texts, should be presumed to have a similar meaning when the same images appear in Revelation. So an image appears in Daniel, we expect the same image to have the same meaning when it appears in Revelation. So when we use the word apocalyptic, we're talking about writings that sometimes use imagery and often describe the end of the world. So let's start with an example of how this works. There's a figure in Revelation who wields an iron scepter. I'm sorry, and a rod of iron. And the one uh, who wields the iron rod, we have to figure out who this is. So let's hear what Revelation says. Revelation 2, 27 and following. Um, and I think... You all got a bunch of verses, is that correct? So you have this? It should be like the first verse on the page uh, on a list of verses. Um, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Okay, it's somebody with authority over the nations who rules with a rod of iron. Revelation 12, 5 and following. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was called up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nursed, for 1260 days. Then Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. 
The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think we know that the figure in Revelation 19 is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if the figure in Revelation 19 is Jesus, then we know that the one wielding a rod of iron is Jesus. But maybe we're not positive, because there's some people who say it's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. So then we go to Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Mm -hmm. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You are my son, says God, to this figure in Psalm 2. That tells us this figure is the son of God. And he has a, a rod of iron. And if we weren't positive that Psalm 2 was talking about Jesus as the son of God, then of course we would go to Hebrews chapter 1 where the writer of the Hebrews says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So in this passage, he says, he's talking about Jesus in Hebrews 1, that's very clear from the context, and he quotes from Psalm 2, which talks about this figure who is the son of God. By tying all these things together, we know that Hebrews is talking about Jesus as the Son of God. We know that Psalm 2, in the exact same language, is talking about one who is the Son of God. And then we look at Revelation, and the figure who wields the iron scepter is the Son of God. And we are going to use these kinds of tools as we look at Revelation, when we find an image... We're not sure what the image is. We look at the Old Testament, or sometimes even the New Testament, and that image appears, and whatever it's defined as in that part of Scripture, that's what we know it means in Revelation. Now, there's a second very similar rule of interpretation called prior definition. If the meaning of an image is defined within apocalyptic material, so if the image is defined, say, in Revelation, the same image has the same meaning throughout the document. Now, that kind of makes sense. I mean, if one image means one thing, and then the exact same image means something entirely different, how are you supposed to know that? How are you supposed to figure it out? That's, like, not fair. You're never going to get the answer. You're never going to know what it means. So when we look at, for instance, Revelation 1, and there's an image of seven lampstands in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. And in Revelation 1, 20, we see this figure of seven lampstands defined as seven churches. Mm -hmm. Then we go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, and there are two lampstands. What are the two lampstands? We don't know exactly, but we know they're churches. And so when people start telling you that the two witnesses in Revelation are Elijah and Moses coming back in physical form, and they do this and they do that, uh, Revelation doesn't give us that freedom. Revelation tells us that the two witnesses are two churches. And then we have to figure out which two churches. We'll talk about that maybe later on. Scholarly documents or textbooks 
tend to define it in terms the first time they appear. But in Revelation, images sometimes are defined after they've been used already. So images um, that aren't defined until later require us to study the entire book. You can't say, well, I've read the first eight chapters of Revelation. Now I know all the images <laughs> because the image might be defined later on. The final um, rule that we're going to use, rule of interpretation, is don't presume to know more than Jesus did. Now, you know what's really funny? I, I remember a few years ago, Harold Camping. Anybody remember him? He had this wonderful thing about how uh, he had this number and that number, and he knew Jesus was coming back on in this year, and maybe even this date. And the thing is, Jesus said he didn't know when he was going to return. Matthew 24, 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. Now, so when Mr. Camping comes up with this information, in order for him to know what the Son didn't know, he had to know things that Jesus didn't know. Now, what would Jesus not know? Would Jesus not know the Old Testament? Hmm, no, he knew the Old Testament. Would Jesus not know the material that's in the Gospels? Uh, no, he lived the Gospels. Would Jesus not know the theology presented by Paul? No, Jesus was a theologian. He knew all the theology. Would Jesus not know... What would Jesus not know? He'd not know little pieces of like the history of Acts. He wouldn't know little things that Paul wrote that described his journeys. He wouldn't know very, very little. And so when someone says that they know the day and hour of Jesus' return, they're presuming to know more than Jesus did. And we can presume that they're wrong. So we are not going to presume to know more than Jesus did. But at the same time, just to balance this, we know that Jesus told us that there are going to be signs of his return that will give us kind of a hint that he's coming soon. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 32 and following, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. So, we don't know the day and hour of Jesus' return. We don't even know the month of his return. We don't even know the exact year of his return. But when we start seeing prophecy fulfilled and things completed that Jesus says have to happen before he returns, we know that the trees are budding out and summer is near. And so that encourages us to look at what's going on in the world and compare it to what Jesus and Revelation give us in terms of prophecy that says, here's what you're looking for when I'm getting ready to return. Now we're going to talk about post-millennialism and we're going to start with the futurist version. Uh, some people have called this kind of a, a view that says every day and in every way things are getting better and better. Is that your experience? <laughs> it's not my experience. And that's why it's, it's a position that's kind of fallen into some disrepute in recent years. But as I discuss this, I'm going to take a kind of conservative approach to historic post-millennialism. Because in the liberal, anti-supernatural version, they don't even worry about the return of Christ. They just say every day and every way, things are getting better and better. And things are going to be great someday. But the conservative folks who hold to post-millennialism 
believe that the gospel is so powerful, the message of Jesus is so powerful, that it will overcome all opposition, and Christ will increasingly overcome the world. And that, for a long time, has been a rather appealing idea. Because we believe that Jesus' message is what the world needs. And we believe that Jesus' message overcomes. We believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so the idea that this message of the gospel would have that kind of impact, and honestly it has. I mean, look at how the gospel has impacted our world today. We know about, like, St. Jude's. And St. Jude's has done amazing things. Started by a devout Catholic. We know that science has progressed dramatically under the influence of Christian men with a Christian worldview who develop scientific advancements, medical advancements, uh, we see our quality of life dramatically improved. Our, how long do people live now? People live into their 80s quite often, 90s quite often. People live into their hundreds sometimes. And this is a result, not of some accident of times gone by. But the gospel of Jesus Christ has so impacted people's hearts that they have desired to improve people's lives. And they've done it through science, technology, medicine, all kinds of ways. So we're not going to just brush this off as though this is a trivial perspective that somebody might have about the return of Christ. In this view of postmillennialism, their timeline looks like this. They start with the death of Christ, and then the millennium starts. Yes, sir? Can you write that word down? Oh, which one? Post-millennialism. Post-millennialism, Post absolutely. I'll put it right here. That is a 25 cent word. I tell you, if you spell that word correctly, you're doing great. So they start with the death of Christ. They go to the millennium. Christ uh, establishes the millennium, which is an ideal time of the gospel spreading and, and changing everything. Then at the end of the millennium, when things are just really, really good, <coughs> Then you have the second coming of Christ, the general resurrection, the general judgment, and then heaven and hell. Now, postmillennialism doesn't think the kingdom of God is going to arrive instantaneously or wholly at the end of the age in something like the second coming of Christ. So they're very different from like the premillennialists. Rather, as their name says, they are post-millennial, Christ comes after the millennium. The arrival of the kingdom is gradual. The gospel progresses. Much, but not all, of the world's population will be converted to Christ. The success of the gospel will bring a reduction, but not total elimination, of the influence and presence of sin. Righteousness, peace, and prosperity will flourish. There will be less evil in the world, the greater the triumph of the church in preaching the gospel and discipling the nations, the more we see the presence of the Holy Spirit in the world. The global long-term forecast of post-millennialism is a truly Christianized world in which every aspect of mankind is improved. So this victory of the church is not merely a spiritual or invisible victory in the Christian's heart, but it is physical, visible, publicly acknowledged. Every domain of human activity 
will be renewed according to Christian principles and brought into the service of Jesus Christ. Post-millennialism is set apart from the other two eschatological views we're going to talk about. We talked about pre-mill, we're going to talk about amill, by its essential optimism for the kingdom of God in this present age. And he, it believes that this optimism is explained by God overcoming the world in this present time. Postmillennialists interpret the whole meaning of the vision in Revelation 19. When we talked about 19, remember the figure wielding the rod of iron? As Christ coming forth, not just to war, but to victory. And every detail of the picture is laid in with a view to precisely emphasize the thoroughness of this victory. The victory even includes a mass conversion of ethnic Israelites. But it's not really our experience, is it? In the world we live in, this is not what we're experiencing. We could have said 50 years ago, yeah, yeah, this is looking good. We're seeing advances in technology and medicine and finance and all of these other areas, but it's not really our experience now. So when we look at the problems with post-millennialism, one of the things that we're told in Scripture is that in the present age, one of the important aspects of our faith is that we suffer with Christ. And the optimism of postmillennialism doesn't really see suffering with Christ as a critical element, especially as the millennium progresses. In Romans 8, 16 and following, Paul writes, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So in Romans 8, from like 16 to 23, we see the church winning by losing, winning by suffering. It also misses the point made in Scripture that because of lawlessness, the love of most will grow cold. The expansion of lawlessness and the impact of the man of lawlessness simply don't fit into this scenario. So, you remember pre-mill, we talked about lawlessness being one of the signs of the return of Christ. And we said, kind of looks like we're seeing lawlessness as one thing that we're currently experiencing. In post-millennialism, you just don't see that. Now that's the futurist view of the return of Christ. There's another view called the preterist view. The view is called preterism. But they call themselves post-millennialists. And that sort of fits because they don't really believe that the millennium, um, that Christ comes until after the millennium, but uh, that's kind of their third coming, if you, if you understand what I'm saying there, just like the pre-mill, pre-trib had a third coming. Now the preterist view came about because of a couple different things. Um, people didn't like pre-mill, pre-trib, and they didn't really know what to do with an alternative view. So they came up with this view because there are a number of statements that appear to suggest that Jesus' return was to be soon after his death. For instance, in Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know summer is near. We just read that. So also, when you see all these things, 
you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So these folks looked at it and said, the Bible says this generation isn't going to pass away until all these things happen. Well, if this generation doesn't pass away, then Jesus must come back 40 years after his death. Hmm. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even in all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And they took that statement very seriously. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. So the preterists, taking all of this very seriously, came up with a theory that Jesus must have come back within the next generation. And then they looked at history, and they said, well, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And that could be Jesus coming in judgment and destroying the temple and destroying the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And um, maybe that whole statement about fleeing to the mountains has to do with 70 AD. And so they built an entire worldview around 70 AD, Jesus came back. And he came back in judgment on the Jewish people by destroying their temple, destroying Jerusalem, and taking many of them off in captivity. Now there are two ways that preterists few things. There is something called full preterism. Full preterism denies the visible future return of Christ. They say there is no future physical resurrection of believers, present mortal bodies. They teach that the final judgment of all men took place in 70 AD. This position is viewed as heretical by almost everybody. Partial preterism also believes Jesus came back in 70 AD, but they believe that he'll come back again after the millennium. millennium. Since full preterism appears to be heretical, we're going to just focus on partial preterism. Now, I've given you two papers that talk about the problems that I see with preterism. But I'm going to give you kind of a quick overview of some of the concerns that I would perceive are a real problem. First of all, as we discussed in Primo Pre-Trib, where in Scripture is an invisible return of Christ? And where is there a third coming described in Scripture? Because I believe Christ comes after the millennium, and he already came. So there's a third coming. Now, what's interesting is for their view to work, they have to take Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and have these two passages fit together very comfortably as talking about the exact same thing. Next week, I'm going to give you a handout because you certainly don't have enough handouts already <laughs> that will talk about the differences between Matthew 24 and Luke 21, because there are significant differences. Luke 21 talks about the Romans destroying Jerusalem. Matthew 24 does not talk about that, rather talks about the return of Christ at the end of human history. 
But you'll recall last week we talked about one of the things that has to happen before Christ returns. And the scriptures are very clear. The Antichrist has to come before the return of Christ. Amen. You remember that from our discussion last week. Um, it was very clear from 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, so the predators had to come up with an Antichrist. And the figure they came up with was Nero. Now, Nero was present before 70 AD. He died in 68 AD. So he died a couple years before the destruction of Jerusalem. He was a terrible persecutor of the church. But he doesn't meet any of the requirements of an Antichrist. First of all, as far as I know, he didn't do any works of wonder. And that's certainly something that we expect of the man of lawlessness from 2 Thessalonians 2. And then there's biblical descriptions of the Antichrist that say that he comes from the church. Now we're here. And those are not in your handout. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and following. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. 1 John 2.22 Who is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. John chapter 4, verses 2 and following. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. 2 John verses one, seven, chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. From all of these passages that talk about the Antichrist, we get a series of characteristics that make up the Antichrist. The first is that he went out from us. That means he was a member of the church. So whoever the Antichrist is, and if you go online, you will find out that the Antichrist is Bill Gates. He's King Charles of England. And assorted other people who are in power. But none of them went out from us. None of them left the church to do whatever. The second characteristic of the Antichrist is he denies that Jesus is the Christ and denies Father and Son. And the third characteristic of the Antichrist is that he denies Jesus came in the flesh. Now when we are anticipating a religious figure who comes out of the church and who becomes the Antichrist, we are going to be looking for a significant major religious figure who denies Jesus and denies basic elements of the faith. It's interesting, I'll give you a kind of freebie. Um, the, the Revelation talks about the Antichrist figure and it describes him as having two horns like a lamb and a voice like a dragon. 
Horns represent sources of power. Mm -hmm. That suggests that he will be in charge of two parts of Christ's church. And has a voice like a dragon. Dragon represents Satan. So the things he says are satanic. And just another little hint, Daniel told us that the people of the one who will come, speaking of the Antichrist, will destroy the city and sanctuary. And the Romans destroyed the city and sanctuary. So we are anticipating that a Roman who's in charge of two parts of Christ's church and who denies basic elements about Jesus Christ will be the Antichrist. And this is why I believe that it will be a rogue pope. Historically, a lot of people blamed the pope and they said this pope and that pope, it's another pope. But many of the popes have been terrible people and many of the popes have been godly people and that doesn't make them Antichrist because the Antichrist will very clearly set himself apart from all the other popes that have ever lived. Interestingly, none of these characteristics fit Nero. And then they tell us that Nero's name adds up to 666, but Nero actually doesn't add up to 666 in their system. They're using what's called gematria. Gematria is where you take the letter A, you want it open the board? Yes. <laughs> okay. The letter A is equal to one, the letter B is equal to two, the letter C is equal to three. But you gotta keep in mind, you're dealing with Greek mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Hebrew. So people play with that. It's like, whoa, it's Hebrew, oh, it's Greek, uh, whatever fits what they end up with. So in order for Nero to add up to 666 and be that beast, they take a form of Nero's name called Nero Caesar. But to get 666, you actually have to misspell Caesar. And you kind of have to convert it from Greek to Hebrew. And it, it's so obvious that you're just trying to make it fit. But Nero doesn't fit any of the characteristics of an Antichrist. So 666 doesn't really matter, does it? I've given you some in your handout of much more detail of how they go about this 666 thing. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a crazy world. <laughs> So, we not only don't have Nero having any of the attributes of the Antichrist, but none of the early church fathers said Nero was the Antichrist. You know, these early church fathers, some of whom, you know, interacted with the Apostle John, um, who interacted with some of the other apostles, uh, very easy for them to say, well, you know, now that I'm writing to you in 80 or 90 AD, Nero was the Antichrist. And Jesus came back in 70 AD, and none of them do. Because Nero wasn't an antichrist. He didn't come out of the church. It's suggested that the destruction of Jerusalem also fits the language of prophecy in Daniel and the Gospels. So in Daniel 12, 1, at that time shall rise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there will be a time of trouble, such as never been since there was a nation until that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And then in Matthew 24, 15 to 22, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, that the one who is on the housetop now go down to take what's in his house, let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. 
And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, it never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. <coughs> but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So the preterists tell us that this is describing both Daniel 12.1 and Matthew 24, this passage, a tribulation that is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But there's a problem. Isn't there always a problem? <laughs> if we read Daniel 12.1, we might want to read Daniel 12.2. Daniel 12, 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I think that's called the resurrection of the dead. I believe that's what it's called. Now, did that happen in 70 AD? Pastor Jeremy, did that happen in 70 AD? Absolutely not. I didn't think so, but I wanted to check. Because I don't remember that happening. I don't remember dead people coming alive in 70 AD. Just my thought. And not only that, but the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem wasn't so bad that no one would ever survive that destruction. In fact, it wasn't even a, that bad a destruction. I mean, yeah, the city was destroyed. Yeah, the temple was destroyed. But do you know about Carthage? <laughs> when the Romans destroyed Carthage, they completely disassembled the city. And then they plowed the entire area and planted salt so nothing would grow. So there would never be another city there. That's a pretty bad destruction. But here's the thing. We can see very clearly Nero's not the Antichrist. And if Nero is not the Antichrist, then preterism doesn't work because they need the Antichrist to come before the return of Christ. So that's what I've got for you. We have 15 minutes to do questions. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, in the passage, who in, in um, 1 John 4, at the end of the verse that you that we read, where it says, um, "And now is in the world already." What what is that about? What, what who was he? Who was he talking about? Very good question. You remember how the earlier passage in chapter two, First um, John two, um, First John chapter 2, and it's 18, to, 18 and 19. Children, it is the last hour, and as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. There is a spirit of the Antichrist, and it's even described here. Um, I think, yeah, in 1 John 4, this is the spirit of of the Antichrist, um, who you have heard it was coming and now is in the world already. The spirit of the Antichrist. And this is a spirit, as it were, that motivates people to be hostile to the gospel. And there have been people hostile to the gospel throughout human history. And these people deny things like Jesus came in the flesh, you know, there are people you will find today who don't believe there was ever a figure named Jesus who really lived. He's a myth. Um, there are people who deny all kinds of things about Jesus. And uh, in many cases, there are people who may have been in the church. Where they, I grew up in the church, and it was all a myth. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That is a spirit that stands against Jesus and it's in the world in John's time, and it's in the world today. And this spirit of Antichrist 
re reappears in more and less intensity throughout human history. There are times when you have a really powerful opposition to the gospel by people who deny Jesus in all kinds of ways. They deny his work, they deny that he lived, they deny that he taught what he taught, they deny all sorts of things. This is the spirit of Antichrist. He's really kind of saying, well, there, there are unbelievers who just, they don't believe. But then there are people who stand against Christ. These are Antichrists. And there are many Antichrists because there's an ultimate Antichrist who will come up at the end of human history. But throughout history, there are Antichrists. Go ahead. What makes you say that it's a rogue pope when it comes to the Antichrist? Okay. The reason I say it's a rogue pope is like basically three points. The first is Daniel says the people of the ruler who will come destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know who destroyed the city and sanctuary, and that is the Romans. They came to Jerusalem in 70 AD, destroyed the city and sanctuary. If you read Daniel, and we don't have time to cover Daniel, but we can talk about it. Um, when you read Daniel, you find this figure who attacks the church, who destroys the holy people, is how Daniel describes it. His people destroy the city and sanctuary. Therefore, this person, whoever he is, is from Rome. Now, could he be a Roman citizen? There, there is no Roman citizen. Could he be from the city of Rome? Possibly. But then we look at Revelation. And in Revelation, there's a description of a figure who has two horns like a lamb and a voice like a dragon. Two horns, meaning two sources of power. The way I understand that is that it's two parts of Christ's church. And that doesn't mean that the guy was born in Rome, moved to the United States, and now he's in charge of First Baptist, and suddenly Second Baptist says, hey, we're going to unite the two churches. No, it has to be a kind of bigger figure. So then when we start thinking about that, well, the Roman church is that bigger. And guess what? The Orthodox church is talking about reuniting with the Roman Catholic church. There are Anglican churches that are in talks to reunify with the Roman Catholic church. So when we see Rome having two parts of Christ's church reunited, it's going to be an indicator to us that whoever either is currently Pope at that time or who becomes Pope after that time will be very likely the Antichrist. There's a lot more things we can say about it, yeah. but that's just a quick overview. Other questions? Uh, in Matthew and in Revelation, it, it keeps saying this generation will not pass away, which makes it seem like it's talking about his generation. Yes. That, that's such an excellent question. The question is about this generation. You read it and you go, yeah, Jesus has to come back in 40 years. And a lot of the believers thought Jesus was coming back soon. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I think Adam and Eve thought the Redeemer was going to come soon. Like when when Eve has her child, I think she kind of thought, here's yeah. the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. We got him. And of course, it took quite a, quite a bit more time. But when it talks about this generation, all these things will be done in this generation. If you look at what it is talking about, it's not talking about the return of Christ per se. It's talking about the signs of the return of Christ. So um, if we can look at Matthew 24, let me find my note where I have this. So in Matthew 24, <clears throat> So, um, if we look at where it says, um, <coughs> uh, 
Okay, can someone remind me where this generation is? 34, Matthew 24, 24. 24, 34, okay. So when we start reading in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us, um, many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah, there will be wars and rumors of wars. He says, but see to it you're not alarmed, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So he's saying, you're gonna see these things, but don't get anxious because the end comes after this. Then he goes on and he says, there'll be kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes. He says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Meaning, this isn't the end when you see these things. You'll be persecuted. People will turn away from the faith. False prophets appear. He says, but the one who stands firm at the end will be saved and the gospel will be preached to the whole world. It's testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Okay, so he's kind of wrapped it up. So then he continues on. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that caused desolation spoken of in Daniel, so now he's talking about what's happening at the very end, the abomination that caused desolation spoken of in Daniel, which is at the very end of human history. But those in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, he's saying that the people in Judea need to flee to the mountains when the abomination that caused desolation, spoken of by Daniel, is established. He says, this is of such urgency that you can't even go back to get your coat. Um, you can't go down the outside stairway from your house, duck in, grab something, yeah. and leave. You don't even have time to do that. So this is very sudden, very abrupt. When you see it, flee. Now, they said this is 70 AD, but guess what? Romans surrounded Jerusalem in, 78, in 68 AD. And then Nero died, murdered by his bodyguards. And the general who was surrounding Jerusalem, whose name was Vespasian, went back to Rome mm -hmm. to become the emperor. Guess how many troops were surrounding Jerusalem in 69 AD? Zero. So, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, leave to the mountains. But if you read Luke 21, they don't say, you know, they don't have this urgency. You don't have time to go down the stairway, grab something and leave. None of that language is there. So as a result, Luke 21 is talking about the 780 destruction. Roman army surrounded, then they left, and get out of there, and they come back and destroy the city and sanctuary. Vespasian sent back another army. They destroyed the city and sanctuary. Now, when we're reading in Matthew, what we're reading about is the end of the world, not 70 AD. That's why there's such urgency, because the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel, mentioned in Matthew, not Luke, is something that causes such urgency, such concern, such worry, such inevitability that you should flee as soon as you see the abomination that caused desolation spoken of in Daniel set up on the side of the temple. And then he says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. That's not describing 70 AD. But for the sake of the elect, the days will be shortened. Then he says, if someone says, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, false prophets, false messiahs, They'll perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if it was possible, even the elect. So then he says, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then he goes on, and he says, He'll send his angels with a loud trumpet call, they'll gather his elect. And so he's saying here in 32, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as twigs the tender and its leaves come out you know the summer is near even so when you see all these things you know that it is near right at the door truly I tell you this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened well what are all these things 
war and rumor of war, famines, earthquakes, all of the false messiahs, false prophets, people falling away. All of these things happened in that generation. But that didn't mean that he was talking about the return, because what did Jesus say? He didn't know the day or hour of his return. That's right. So he can't be telling us the day and hour of his return. He can't even be telling us the generation of his return because he tells us the signs and then tells us when you see these signs, you know it's near. And the generation doesn't pass away until <coughs> famines, earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, all of those things. Okay? What's you, Patrick? As, as, as we're looking at these days, you know, everything that you're speaking about is going on now. Absolutely. Pretty much. Because yeah. if, as we read and as we look and as we study, it comes on TV. It's right there in your plain view. And when you get the understand of what really is happening here, it's already going. On. But guess what? Who can say it? that? And people say, oh, that's the end of the world. No. Like I said, no one knows when he comes. When he comes, like well, we a thief in the night. We have two indicators then to the world. Mm -hmm. This gospel will be proclaimed throughout the world, and then the end will come. And because of lawlessness, mm -hmm. the love of most will grow cold. Those are the two indicators that I see that indicate the end of the world. That's right. And that doesn't give us a day or hour, it doesn't give us a month, it doesn't give us a year, but we are seeing these things kind of coming to a place where we think the gospel's been proclaimed mm -hmm. through most of the world, not necessarily all of it, but most of it. Right. So is is the abomination that the cause of desolation, does, is that a third element that has to happen? And if it is, does, does the temple in Jerusalem have to be rebuilt to that to take place? Excellent question. The temple in Jerusalem being rebuilt is a critical element in pre-mill pre-trib. Okay. Because they have reestablished animal sacrifice for the Jews. But that would be an abomination in God's sight. Mm -hmm. Because animal sacrifice, according to Hebrews, okay. is nothing. It was a placeholder until the Messiah came. Okay. So no, the temple doesn't have to be rebuilt. You remember we talked about the mark of the beast and it is a ceremony? So when we see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of in Daniel, and it talks about it being built on one wing of the temple, what that would indicate is that it is something built adjacent to the temple. It looks to me like the place it would be built is a wailing ball. Like mm -hmm. building off of the willow. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like to me. I, I'm not going to claim, oh, this is the absolute answer. There are very few things where I say, this is the absolute answer. I can say, it looks like, I believe it is, but I'm relying on scripture. And again, this is the whole point of this. It's not to say, hold this view or hold that view or this view is the right view because none of the traditional views are the right view. The right view is what scripture teaches us and what we can derive from the teaching of scripture. And what I want to give you is tools by which you can derive this information so that you can build your own worldview about the end of time. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, uh, I know you mentioned you mentioned the problem with uh, dementia and suffering in the post millennial. Are you, is there any other issues or, or problems or dangers you see the ministry operating out of that from your experience? Um, I, I think the views have largely been discredited, uh -huh. honestly, because uh -huh. um, it's just not consistent with what we see in the world today. Mm -hmm. It looked a lot more comfortable back in the 30s, 40s, 50s when post millennialism was very popular because people were very optimistic about the world. Um, recall World War I? You know what it was called? The war to end all wars. Because a post-millennial view said, oh yeah, we have a war, 
Okay, but we got smarter now. We know how terrible war is. We'll never have another war. 20 years later, Hitler arises, and we end up with more wars. So it, it is a very optimistic view, and that very attribute is a problem because we don't see evidence that we should be optimistic. And all of the language in scripture about being persecuted, if you faithfully try to serve Jesus, you will be persecuted. Um, all the language about the need for us to suffer with Christ, that is so antagonistic to this kind of an optimistic point of view. If Christ takes over every aspect of the world and we live in almost an ideal state, where's suffering? Where is suffering with Christ? It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's 10 04. Good time for us to end. Uh, let's close in prayer. We're going to try and upload another copy of today's lecture uh, or Sunday school class, however we're going to describe it, uh, up to the website. So um, if you want to review it, once it's been kind of processed, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, we'll go ahead and get it up there and, and you guys can watch it. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for loving us. We love you for um, the fact that we know you're coming back for us. And Lord, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So we ask your blessing on our time of worship. We ask your blessing on the preacher today and on the worship team. We ask for every part of our service to honor you and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And